So we began with a community question. Who was your favorite teacher, best teacher you ever had and why? And who was the teacher that you preferred the least and why? And that's going to set us up to get thinking about the spiritual gifts, especially the speaking gifts and the gift of teaching. Can you believe it? We began this series on January the 28th. You were much younger then. <laughs> um, and we've had plenty of breaks, and that's why it's taken this long. But today we conclude the series. I do want to say this that I don't think I've said throughout this entire series, and that is this. Spiritual gifts are not trophies. They are tools. They're not trophies to be displayed. They are tools to be used. I hope that message has come clearly through, even though it hasn't been stated. And that is why uh, Debbie read from Romans 12, verse 3, Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. And then he goes on to talk about the gifts that he's distributed to those who are believers. Everything we have, even our faith, our very life, comes from God. And so it's all just in our hand as a stewardship to give back to him in service for him and for others. I had a mentor years ago who said these six words to me. Go slow, keep low, and don't blow. I think of those words often. Go slow, keep low, and don't blow. And no matter how gifted we are, 1 Corinthians 13, if I have all these incredible gifts but have not love, I am nothing, I have nothing, right? So it's all something that we hold as a trust and as a stewardship. Let's review for the last time, the last time, uh, how many spiritual gifts are listed in the New Testament. So you get to do some counting right now. Okay, we're going to review super quickly. Here's the four big categories of spiritual gifts. So we first looked at the support gifts. There were three of them, right? Apostles, prophets, and pastors. If you were to go back to the February recording, you will hear those messages if you uh, miss those. We looked at the serving gifts, uh, which includes serving, helping, giving, leading, showing mercy, administration. There are six to be added to the three. Then we spent a lot of time on the supernatural revelatory gifts. We looked at prophecy, miracles, healing, uh, faith, tongues, interpretation of tongues, distinguishing of spirits. Last week we looked at word of knowledge, word of wisdom. There's nine there. What are we up to? Very good. Very good. And finally today, the speaking gifts. We're looking at teachers, which are a gift, and the teaching. We're looking at evangelists who are a gift and evangelism and then exhortation or encouragement. So there's three. So how many in total? 21. Those are the ones that are listed. There is a good argument to be made that there are examples of other gifts, both in scripture and extra biblically that God does give by his spirit. But we're going to look at these last three. So first of all, teachers or teaching. Okay. Um, here's, here's the definition of this gift. The gift of the teacher or of teachers of teaching is the Spirit's presence and ability in a believer to teach God's word with clarity, apply it with accuracy so that people grow in Christian maturity. Those three elements really, really matter. Uh, a person had, so we're not just talking about teaching math, right? Or social studies or geography. We're talking about teaching God's word with clarity, applying it accurately, and then seeing people grow in maturity. So where are some environments for teaching here at Belmont Village Church? Well, our discipleship villages are where teachers express their gifting and teach. In some of our missional families, there is a teaching element uh, with that. In our BBC Village Kids Ministry, there is the opportunity for teaching gifts. 
and of course Sunday morning, but not only Sunday morning. In fact, you know what the scriptures say? That we are to teach and admonish one another. That word admonish is kind of a, a strong word. It means to place the mind on God. To place the mind. Because right now it's not maybe on God. It's to encourage or exhort or admonish in a strong way. But there's teaching involved with that. But here's the point. The goal of teaching is not simply the transfer, transfer of information. The teacher I preferred the least growing up was an English teacher in grade nine because of how much of a power trip the guy was on. I won't even go there. But my next most least favorite would be a second year uh, biochem prof who did what was shared earlier, just kind of read the lecture the entire time. And in fact, after three weeks, that class went from 300 students to about 150, and a petition was going around to be signed by the students that was going to go to the university to have her removed as a professor, especially a teaching professor. Apparently she was a wonderful uh, researcher, but just a terrible teacher. I never did sign that. I continued to go to class, but I noticed that everything I read in the textbook was the same thing she was saying. It was just really, really, really dry. Didn't learn a whole lot. My best teacher was a third year chemistry professor named Dr. Prokipchuk. Do you know how many professors I remember their names? Hardly any, but I still remember Dr. Prokipchuk from, from University of Guelph. Every year he would win professor of the year. He was teaching chemistry, but he taught it in such an engaging way that we, we cared about why these chemical equations were there and why they mattered. Like he got us to not way beyond the what to the why, why it mattered. And I remember just being strangely changed by him. He's also the prof that on the final exam, I showed up at 1900 hours for the final exam thinking 1900 hours was 9 p.m. And I got there at 8.30 p.m. with a half an hour to go. And I walk in, and he sees me, and he knew all his students by name. And he walks up to me, he says, Gord, what are you doing? I told the whole class, I'm going on a fishing trip immediately after this exam. You've got a half an hour. I'm so sorry. And I sat down, and I remember being so <laughs> flustered, I couldn't even spell my name. <laughs> and I thought, I am... I'm going to have to do this class. I'm glad I like him so much. I'm doing this class again <laughs> next, next year. And he came to me at about 20 minutes in. He said, Gord, take as long as you need. He gave me about an extra hour just because that's the kind of guy he was. Like, he's just an amazing person. And um, I'm really thankful for him and feel very changed by him. And that's chemistry. We're talking about the Word of God here. So the goal of teaching the Word of God is not just a transfer of information, but rather a transformation of character. That our minds would be transformed. That our hearts would be transformed. That our will would be transformed. Something changes when the teaching is infused by a gift of God. You've probably all heard the story of the pastor and the taxi driver who were both believers in Jesus, but sadly they, they went on to, to, to glory, they died, and, and they're standing in the future at the judgment seat of Christ, and the, the, the um, Christian taxi driver was first in line, and the pastor was next behind him, and so the, the uh, taxi driver goes in, he meets with the Lord, and he comes out wearing a robe and a sash and a crown. And the pastor who's next is thinking, wow, I've been the pastor for 50 years at the first church of Arnprior, and so can you imagine what I'm going to get? But he's before the Lord, and the Lord gives him a, a nice vest, a scarf, and a cap. He says, Lord, I don't understand. I've been a pastor for 50 years teaching your word, and that taxi driver got a robe and a sash and a crown. And the Lord said, well... When you preached, a lot of times people slept. But when he drove, people prayed. <laughs> people prayed. There was real transformation. Right? 
See, that's the goal. That's the goal. Some of you are like, no, that's a terrible joke. The goal is that our heart, our head, our hands will change, be transformed by what we hear. And, and transformed to what? To be more like Jesus. If the teaching isn't about Jesus, it completely misses the mark. Christian maturity equals this, becoming more and more and more like Jesus. You remember our kind of favorite definition of disciple here at BBC? It's someone who follows Jesus, is being changed by Jesus, and is committed to the mission of Jesus. That is clearly taught by Jesus. See, teaching is not just about being interesting or engaging. Teaching helps people to love God and love others better. And it starts with character. First, in the character of the teacher. And then the goal being the character development of those being taught. So as a teacher, it's not enough to just teach it. It must be lived as well. We must live it and not just teach it. That's why one of my favorite scriptures in all of the New Testament about Jesus is in Acts 1, verse 1. When Luke says to his friend Theophilus, he begins these words, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. He didn't practice what he preached. He preached what he'd been practicing. And that's exactly what a teacher must be and do. They must practice what they then preach. I think I've showed you this illustration before. For years, I thought as a pastor and teacher that what I was supposed to do was do this. Be in the word of God and give it to you. Be in the word of God and give it to you. But I learned more than a decade ago that no, what God calls me to is this. So it starts here and then to you. Um, for the church, teaching brings growth, it brings health, and it brings protection to the church. There's so much I could say about that, but when you look at the calling of a, a pastor, elder in the church, it is someone who protects the doctrine and protects the sheep in the church. Well, here are the texts that refer <clears throat> to teachers or teaching. And we're going to look at those first two. So Ephesians 4.11, Christ himself gave the pastors and, notice not the gift of teaching, but the gift of the teacher or teachers. And in 1 Corinthians uh, 12, 28, God has placed in the church third teachers. Do you remember that list? It says first apostles, second prophets, third teachers. But these are foundational gifts for the church. In 1 Timothy 4, 13, Paul says to Timothy, until I come, devote yourself. Devote yourself to the public reading of scripture to preaching and to teaching. To preaching and to teaching. In 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, Paul says, Entrust what I taught you, Timothy, to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. That is the four-man or four-woman relay right there. Paul to Timothy, Timothy to others, those others to yet others again, to teach. And then in Acts 18, uh, is that incredible scripture about Apollos where he'd been instructed in the way of the Lord. He spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. And then listen to these words. Here's the protection. Apollos vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. That's what a teacher has the gifting to do, to defend the faith in such a way that... Uh, uh, Prove that Jesus is the Messiah. And finally, this last scripture is so, so key. John 5, 39. These are the words of Jesus. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. 
Can you imagine Jesus having the audacity to say that? But as the Messiah, he can. He has every right to. All of these scriptures, Old and New Testament, are all about me. And then he says, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Here's the bottom line. Here's the bottom line. Then we'll move to the next gift. Great teaching. You may not remember what was said. But you know that God used it to change you. And that's the bottom line. You know that God used that teaching, that teacher, to change you. All right, the next speaking gift. So much more could be said, but we actually want to conclude this spiritual gift series this week. So the gift of evangelists or evangelism, and here's the definition. The gift of the evangelist or evangelism is the Spirit's presence and ability in a believer to help non-Christians take the necessary steps to place their faith in Jesus for salvation. Now, pause for a moment. A lot of Christians like to say, well, I don't have the gift of evangelism, so I don't actually ever have to share with people about my faith in Jesus. Well, there's only one problem with that. God's word. <laughs> Where it says that every believer in Jesus is a witness for Jesus. Look on the screen. 1 Peter 3.15, always be prepared. This is for all the believers he's speaking to. To give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Have you ever said, I don't do windows. <laughs> I do dishes. I sweep floors. I don't do windows. Have you heard that expression before? Maybe you don't do toilets. I don't know what it is, but I don't do windows. Well, no Christian can say, I don't do witness. Because we are witnesses. That's who we are. That's our identity as disciples and followers of Jesus. So we do witness. But the difference between a witness and an evangelist is that someone who has an evangelistic gift, when they share, people end up coming to faith in God. Not always, but often. Now, when you think of, of an evangelist, don't, don't say it loud, but who comes to your mind? Different people come to mind, right? Especially Billy Graham, but, but others may come to mind. I think of someone else. I think of someone else. And, and let me lead in with the story. Does anyone here know what that is and where it is? Anyone at all? My wife does. Where? University of University of Rock. Yeah, that is called Old Jeremiah, the canon. It's in Branion Plaza, right in the heart of University of Guelph. And that was there when I started 42 years ago at Guelph, and it just keeps getting painted, like weekly. And every so often, they actually have to take a whole bunch of layers of the paint off because of how incredibly heavy it is, and they keep painting it, painting it, and so you're, you're free to do that. Um, but, but why I'm telling you that is this. Just over here is a pathway and then a big grassy area in front of a restaurant called the Bull Ring Cafe and, or pub. And every Tuesday at noon, a guy named John, a Christian maybe 10 years older than me, I was like 19 at the time, he was probably about 29, he would stand there and he would just start talking out loud about very controversial subjects. I remember one Tuesday him talking about euthanasia. I remember him talking one Tuesday about abortion. And one Tuesday about this and that, and like just topic after topic, but people would gather around, gather around, start kind of arguing with him. But he always had this incredible ability to bring it around to the good news about Jesus, and to proclaim the gospel. He was so gifted at it. But then one Tuesday, he had invited a ringer a guy from the United States named Tom Short. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll show you this slide. So Tom Short, he was with, at the time, uh, what is now Power to Change Campus for Christ. And Tom got there, and I remember John and Tom having a talk about where he was supposed to stand, and Tom said, no, I've got a better place. So you see over to the right, you see those two girls walking up that pathway, and then on the right, there's a bit of a... Uh, 
like a railing, okay, but then the cement area. So here's another view of that cement area. Tom got on here and walked up and down the entire time. I will never forget. Just giving the gospel out loud, but he would go from one end to the other and kids are walking by, but a crowd of two, 300 kids gathered. It was amazing to hear him present the gospel. And then he actually gave an invitation. He had the boldness to give an invitation. And kids came to faith that day, right there. It was just so incredible. And I looked up Tom last week. I thought, is he still at it? And he is. TomThePreacher.com. Tom Short's still at it. Here's a picture recently of him just standing at a campus preaching the gospel. Praise God. Like, what a gift this guy is to the body of Christ, to the world, so effective. Now, we see that, though. We see a Tom Short. We hear of a Billy Graham. We say, that's not me. I could never do that. Someone helped you find Jesus. Someone helped me find Jesus. A woman named Dawn. A Sunday school teacher. With the gift of evangelism. Shared the good news with me. And I came to faith. God is calling us with as little or as much gifting as we have to share Jesus. Here's the thing. Evangelists care about and have hearts that break for the people in their life that are far from God. They long for them to come home to a relationship with Jesus. Evangelists are sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. We're about to see that with Philip. In fact, here's all the texts to do with evangelism. Look at Ephesians 4, verse 11. Christ himself gave the evangelist. In Acts 21, 8, uh, we hear of Philip. Listen to what it says. We reached Caesarea, says Luke, and stayed at the house of Philip, the evangelist. In Acts 8, 5 to 6, we have the story of, of Philip sharing effectively the gospel in Samaria. And then in Acts 8, 26 to 40, Philip's evangelism to the Ethiopian eunuch. But listen to the sensitivity to the voice of God and the Spirit of God in Philip. It says, an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go to the desert road. Now he could have said, wait a minute, I'm an evangelist. I need people to evangelize. But he hears from an angel, go to the desert road. Okay, Lord, I don't know who's going to be out on the desert road, but I'll go. He started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch. The spirit told Philip, go to that chari chariot and stay near it. Again, he's not told to go and start like proclaiming Jesus to this Ethiopian. Just go to the chariot and stay near it. Evangelists aren't just like, I'm going to proclaim. I'm no, they're sensitive to the voice of God. Can I encourage you in your workplace? in your neighborhood, with your friends, with your family. Just be sensitive to the voice of God. He could be calling you to a, a divine appointment that he has made for you. And he just wants you to join in. And he'll give you what to say in the moment. You have no idea what that person's going through. Philip didn't know what the, evangel or the Ethiopian eunuch was going through as he's reading Isaiah 53 and wanting to know what it all meant. Amazing. Uh, the next text is Acts 14, 21. They preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. In 2 Timothy 4, 5, Paul says to Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. And then finally, 1 Thessalonians 1, 5, our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. It's not just speaking words. It's spirit-infused words from God about God. Here's the bottom line about evangelism. This is how the church grows. Sadly, in North America, too often, one church shrinks while another one grows. It's just a rotation of people. But through evangelism, the church grows. People proclaim Christ, and the results are always in God's hands but people come to faith. Well, let's look at the last, the third speaking gift. 
and that's the gift of encouragement. Now, you might look at that and say, well, why does it say exhortation and encouragement? Because your Bibles do. So the NIV will say encouragement. The ESV, the New King James, the NASB will say exhortation, okay? Um, so some translate it one way, some the other. Here's the Greek word, para kaleo. Kaleo means to call, para means beside. So the word literally means to call someone alongside you. That's what it means. Now it also has this use though in the Bible of a person being called to offer up evidence in court. I think just looking at the English word, we get what it means, don't we? N, courage. To put in courage. To put in courage. May I ask you a question? Do you ever need courage for things? Do you need courage for certain situations? Do you need courage for that surgery that's coming up? Do you need courage for that conversation that you're going to have with someone? Do you need courage to go to work every day? Do you need courage to speak to a crowd? I do. Every Sunday that I speak, I need courage. I need courage placed in me to do this. So that's the idea. Now the word exhortation, I like to put it this way, is encouragement with a shot of apple cider vinegar. <laughs> There's a little bite to it. There's a challenge to exhortation. It's similar to the word admonishment. Okay, so here's a definition. The gift of encouragement is the Spirit's presence and ability in a believer to strengthen people's faith through a word of comfort or exhortation. Now, it is words, and that's why it's in the category of the speaking gifts, but you know as well as I do that it often is accompanied by actions. It's a visit with words. And sometimes the ministry of presence alone is enough without words to encourage people. Sometimes it's soup <laughs> and a word. Sometimes it's a card with words in it. Sometimes it's just help, right? Those are great encouragement. Again, literally to be called alongside someone in need. Not simply to encourage someone's emotional well-being, but their faith. Right? We all need encouragement emotionally. And so through relationships. But this is about encouraging one's faith. Okay? That's what it always is leading to. Young and old need encouragement. Would you agree? Do spiritual leaders need encouragement? You say, no. They're tight with God already. They don't need any encouragement. <sighs> Disciples of Jesus on the front lines, are under fire constantly. They need encouragement more than most. I hear that continually in pastors' gatherings and church leaders' gatherings, that, that they need encouragement because of the fire that they constantly feel like they're under. And you know what? God, by his grace and through people's prayers, gives the encouragement when it's needed. Just two weeks ago, when we were at Joy Bible Camp, a young man about 38, 39 years old came to the beach and he said, Gord, can, can we talk for a minute? And he's now a husband and a father of five who lives down in Nova Scotia. But he used to be in our youth group back in the day, back in Hamilton. And he sits down with me and he says, Gord, can I tell you that between youth group and youth camp up here at Joy, and the community that was created, and he got emotional. He's a big, strong, about six foot three carpenter, and he's starting to cry. And he says, I am who I am today because of those things. And I just want to say thank you for your part in it. He was saying thank you to me because God used me in a very small way in his life. But I got to tell you, Cody's words and his life, the life that he's living, was and is somewhat of a struggle.
strong encouragement to me. It puts wind in the sails to keep going. It really does. And that story is about God. He's the hero in that story. But by God's grace, that's what encouragement can do. And encourage, an encourager knows how to use God's word to encourage. The encouragement is that they bring people to God and they bring God to people. They bring God's words to people. Encouragers have a desire that people will live lives of obedience to God. An encourager is sensitive to those who need encouragement. Uh, let me just say this. Dysfunction breeds dysfunction. When situations of life are difficult, they're hard, they're dysfunctional, the feelings that follow can be negative and can lead to depression even, right? And so dysfunction can breed dysfunction. Encouragement gets us to God. Gets us to see him above what we're looking at. Gets us to hear him above what we're hearing. Gets his perspective above the circumstances we're living in. So it's so, so important. Here's just three scriptures about encouragement. Uh, Romans 12 and 8, we read it. If your gift is to encourage, then give encouragement. Acts 14, 22, listen to this. Barnabas and Paul strengthened the disciples and encouraged them to remain true to the faith. And then finally, and this is for all of us, Hebrews 10, 24 to 25, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. The big takeaway is this. Encourage someone this week. Pray about it. Let God's spirit direct you to someone sensitively that you can encourage. Don't advertise it. Just do it. Don't say, I'm an encourager, so I'm going to encourage you. No, just encourage people. Just encourage people. Well, those are the spiritual gifts that's the series complete. I'm going to show you one last slide, and then we're going to have communion. And it's the slide that we put up on January the 28th, week one. And it's the principles, the eight principles about spiritual gifts. Okay? Just as a reminder, number one, spiritual gifts, every one of them, are a manifestation of God's spirit. That's what they are. That's what scripture calls them. Two, Jesus' followers are commanded to eagerly desire spiritual gifts. There are different kinds or types of spiritual gifts. Number four, every Jesus follower has been given spiritual gifts in the plural. Five, God chooses the spiritual gifts that you have. Six, your spiritual gifts are for building others up. Number seven, your spiritual gifts are important and necessary, but not more important than any others spiritual gifts and number eight we're accountable to god for how we steward his spiritual gifts to us god expects us to use them can i be honest with you as i looked over this list last week i was filled with awe about something where does your life and my life come from Where does your family that you have come from? Where do the relationships that are so life-giving in your life, where do they come from? Where does your ability to think and do anything, where does it come from? Where do all these gifts come from? Who is the giver? Anyone? God is. God is the giver. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father. But God is more than simply a giver. What does communion remind us of, and what does it remind us about? That God is both the giver and he is the gift himself. For God so loved the world of people that he gave himself. He gave his only 
son. God the giver also gives himself. Can you see? This is what really kind of blew me away in worship is that it is such a one-way river <laughs> coming toward us. God is such a giver. He just gives and gives and gives. And in our weak moments, we're tempted to think that God asks too much of us. He asks us to surrender <laughs> with a promise that if we surrender our life, we'll find true life. But if we don't surrender our life, we'll lose our life. But he says surrender. And we might think it's too much. But none of it was ever ours. None of it was ever ours. Our breath, our life is simply a stewardship that we will stand before God and answer to one day. We steward everything that is his. And that's why when we come to communion, the river just keeps flowing our way. Remember, he took the bread. He gave thanks to God, and he said, this is my body given for you. Likewise, he took the cup, and after he'd given thanks to God, he said, this is my life's blood given, poured out for you. Our minimal response, our minimal response, Paul says, is therefore because of the tender mercies of God, I present my entire being, my body, a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is my reasonable act of worship. Because he's given so much. And all he asks of us for today is to remember him. Remember him to the Father. Remember his sacrifice. Can we do that? Can we do that today? Yeah. Let's bow and let's pray and give thanks for all that God has given. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for giving your spirit. Thank you for giving your word. Thank you for giving us life to live. Thank you for giving us the very clothes on our back, the shelter we enjoy the relationships we have, this church, Lord. Thank you for the gifts that just constantly keep on giving and are traced back to your hand and your heart. But God, thank you most of all for your son. He who spared not his own son, how will he not with him freely give us all things? God, we are just the recipients of your kindness and grace and we're here with our lives to say thank you not just in a song not just in a, an offering not just in a, in a moment of, of sentimentality Lord as we remember Jesus at the Lord's Supper but with our lives as we leave this place we say here is your life that you gave me to steward I give it to you use me in any way that you will God, thank you for these elements now, for the opportunity to remember Jesus in his name.